Hello, and welcome to the new series of Frontiers, programmes in which we shall look at developments in science and technology in the Anglia region. The most pressing problem in aviation today is the sheer volume of traffic. Heathrow Airport alone handles over 1,000 passenger flights a day. That's more than one a minute. This is Heathrow, Heathrow, 1049 weather, surface wind 3.0 degrees at 12 knots. Visibility the skies of southern Britain are crowded, and at peak times, air traffic controllers are stretched to the limit. Yet, by the year 2000, it looks likely that total air traffic will double. So, at the Royal Aerospace Establishment in Bedford, work is underway to develop more efficient air traffic control systems for the 21st century. The aim is to improve navigation and ground-to-air communication so that planes can fly closer together, allowing more aircraft to use the same amount of airspace. The research is supported by the Civil Aviation Authority, who want to increase capacity while maintaining safety in the skies. Much of the experimental work is done on board this BAC-111. The aircraft is 24 years old but it carries some of the most advanced avionics equipment in the world. Scientists go on board to test some of the systems they've installed in their flying laboratory. The plane does appear to be fairly standard, although close inspection of the fuselage reveals one or two aerials that you wouldn't find on a commercial jet. But inside is a sight you won't see on a holiday flight. Racks and racks of electronic equipment put in where rows of seats would normally be. The first requirement for improved air traffic control is knowing much more precisely the position of each aircraft. At the moment, most modern airliners find out where they are in the sky by receiving radio signals from two ground beacons in the region where they're flying. A computer estimates the distance from those beacons and then works out the plane's position. But radio signals aren't always reliable. They're sometimes noisy, and that can blur the estimation of distance to the beacons. RAE Bedford believe the answer is to get signals from more stations so that the effect of a noisy signal can be cancelled out. They've programmed this computer to take information from up to five ground stations and calculate the plane's position much more accurately. You can see what's happening on the display screen up here. A special agile receiver hunts to see what signals are available and then selects the five most suitable stations. They're the ones marked in green on the map. We've got four in England and one in Holland. You need a good geographical spread in order to pinpoint the plane's position. This experimental system has proved to be accurate to within less than a tenth of a mile, whereas the best of current systems is only accurate to about a quarter of a mile. Now that may not sound a lot of difference, but it certainly is when you're trying to control a host of aircraft heading for the same airport. Up in the cockpit, the pilot's instruments are being updated. The traditional display of dials and needles is simply inadequate, with flight and navigation systems becoming so sophisticated. The modern flight deck contains colour cathode ray tube displays. In this plane, two screens provide virtually all the pilot needs to know. The one on the left is the primary flight display, and the one on the right is the navigation display. RAE Bedford helped to develop and flew the world's first colour CRT displays and they're now standard equipment in most modern airliners. But this experimental aircraft has introduced a new dimension to the navigation display, that of time. When the display is in map mode, you can see the plane's programmed route with the aircraft in centre screen. When the fourth dimension is switched in, the pilot is given a projected time of arrival at each waypoint ahead of him on the flight. If air traffic control wants him to reach his last waypoint before landing at a certain time, that can be keyed in 
and the plane's speed adjusted accordingly. Here, the scale of the map's been changed to give a closer view of the route. You can see the first waypoint moving down the screen as the plane flies towards it. Peter England, who's in charge of Bedford's civil avionics research, believes these flexible 4D displays and the five-beacon navigation are vital for future air traffic control. Computers will work out exactly where planes are, where they will be, and how they can miss each other. But it's all dependent on better communication between the plane itself and air traffic control on the ground. Radio contact is neither quick nor comprehensive enough, and sometimes it's barely understandable, as in this example of a conversation recorded in English with a Greek air traffic controller. And uh, Tango Uniform is passing 250. Uh, Tango Uniform, you're unreadable, say again. In order to get a fast, detailed and accurate flow of information, RAE Bedford are experimenting with a satellite data link. A computer in the plane speaks directly to computers on the ground via a satellite 20,000 miles above the Earth. The use of a satellite means messages can be received and transmitted almost anywhere on Earth. The plane never goes out of range, which is what happens with VHF radio. Once the computer is programmed, it automatically exchanges a stream of numerical data, much more quickly and accurately than any voice link. Here, it's supplying a full range of flight and weather details to experimental monitoring stations in England, France and Spain. Well, they are asking us about once a minute at the moment exactly where we are. And by using this information, they can build up a very comprehensive picture just like a radar screen of where we are. Now, this information can be used in regions over the Atlantic or any other ocean, for example, and this means that aircraft can be spaced closely together as if they were within radar coverage in very difficult areas of the world. With this predictive element, for example, uh, with individual planes, knowing where you're going to be at what time, does that mean that each plane will have its own little bit of preserved airspace? I think if, if you imagine that as each aircraft travelling through an imaginary tube in space, each space is the aircraft's property for the time that it is there, and air traffic control can make sure that no two tubes touch, and then we know that the system will be safe. And what will the air traffic controller be using on the ground in the 21st century? Well, we have to recognise that the future task of the air traffic controller will be very different from what it is now. At the moment, he uses a radar screen and its human prediction capability to separate aircraft out. In future, he will be using computers and much more advanced displays to help him in this task. And this research and research elsewhere on the, in air traffic control centers will all come together for this new system for the 21st century. Eastern, Nugget 83, approaching Watersham. Watersham would like to turn right, maintaining 210 towards Cambridge. Back in the cockpit, RAE Bedford are trying to cut down on the drudgery of button pushing, which can take up a lot of the pilot's time, particularly as he prepares to land. They've developed direct voice input, a system whereby the pilot can talk to his instruments and alter them by voiced command. At the moment, the system is in a laboratory down on the ground, although it has been used in flight. RAE Bedford are world leaders in this technology, which involves a speech recognizer and microprocessor being connected to the usual flight deck instruments. Using this system, the pilot can control his aircraft simply by speaking into a microphone on the headset. The words are heard by the speech recognizer and then translated by the microprocessor below into instructions for the equipment on the flight deck. While we're safely on the ground, I'm going to ask it to carry out a few commands. This equipment has already been programmed for my voice. 
It takes about 20 minutes to train it for a new pilot speech, and the information is then stored on one of these disks, which can then be pushed into the speech recognizer whenever that pilot's on duty. Now, let's assume I'm coming in to land at Bedford. The first thing I want to do is to tune in to the Bedford VHF radio frequency. So let's try telling the equipment to do that. Box 3, Bedford Tower. OK. You'll notice it was a woman's voice replying. That's because pilots have decided that a woman's voice is more recognizable in the cockpit. And on this display unit here, you can see what the speech recognizer is hearing. And down on the control unit, the display unit here, you can see that already box three has been tuned to the Bedford frequency. Now I want to tune into their instrument landing system at Bedford. Let's see if we can do that. ILS pair 108 decimal three. 1083. Enter. Okay. That single instruction has saved me 16 button pushes. The command to retune to Bedford Tower saved eight button pushes. So you can see that at a crucial time, the pilot is freed from this manual task to monitor more important things. The speech recognizer has a capacity of 640 words, and this system has been used to fly Bedford's BAC 111, the first plane in the world to do so. Such things as height, speed and route have all been changed by command from the pilot. The direct voice input system is now going to be installed and tested in a Tornado fighter bomber based at Bedford. Pilots of these military jets have a lot more to do than civilian pilots. They're flying very fast and at low level. Direct voice control of their aircraft would allow them to look out more often and keep a closer watch on flight deck display. The pilot on this plane was kept quite busy, but Cranfield's research could result in design changes on the flight decks of future airliners, particularly long-haul jets. Every year, half a million commercial aircraft touch down on British runways. As traffic increases, clearly will need more and more sophisticated systems to control them. But man must remain in charge. That's something scientists at RAE Bedford are well aware of. And they're monitoring the computers that they're introducing in the air and on the ground and searching for new ways in which man can communicate with them. Let's hope that the work being done here and at Cranfield will help to make air travel cheaper and safer in the years to come.